Hey, what's up? This is Steve here at Scooter West, Best Motorsport in San Diego. Uh, we've got a brand new Sprint, 2015, 20 miles on it. My good friend from high school that actually bought this thing let his buddy drive it. And this is what happened. The thing got pretty demolished in a short period of time. But because the Vespas are so well built and they retain their value so well, uh, we were able to... Uh, order a replacement frame we're working on a complete frame swap just to let you know the guy walked away from this accident unscathed believe it or not here go check it on robot the main objective with this video is to not show you that damaged frame but to highlight the different mechanical components and get really nerdy about all the improvements that they've that have been made and we're going to talk about the fork the engine and various other components but we're going to start with the engine because even from my perspective i don't work on these things but seeing this thing on the bench it is significantly advanced and improved over the older 150 so robot hey take it away what can you tell us about this all right so this is the newer three valve motor it's been around for a couple of years this is like the on the sprint for primavera it's kind of a second generation motor they actually are a little higher power output and they're a little quicker than the older one, the older three valve motor used on the, uh, the Fly 150. They have like a newer fuel injection system that's simpler. It's just a, um, a throttle body. This is your idle control valve right here. And up in the front of the scooter is where the actual little brain box is that controls the, um, you know, the fuel injection, the DCUs, if you want to call it. And so this is what you would see if you were to pull the seat bucket out? Right, you just would see, yeah, that is crazy. I never noticed that there was not really a bigger body right there where the traditional injection thing is. Sorry, Robot, I hijacked it. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a, you know, tons of uh, improvements on this motor. The electric start system on it is uh, very much like the GTS. There's not the little Bendex gear that, if anybody's familiar with the ET4 LX, it kind of make a lot of noise when they start. The whole starting system is actually in the oil bath of the engine. It's a one-way clutch that's uh, behind the alternator cover right there. Well, this looks like the starter motor right on top, right? Mm -hmm. Grab something to point with, maybe like a pointy, like a long. I want to use a big long uh, engine <laughs> bolt right here. All right, so starter motor. So you got a starter motor right here. There's your air box for the air filters, and to take the air filter off, you kind of get a good idea of what needs to be taken off with the motor outside. You got three Phillips fasteners, and they put these little uh, thumb screws right here because you can't really get a screwdriver up in there. Um, sometimes they're a little tight, you might have to slip a needle nose up there to get them uh, loosened up or to use a, uh, a real short little, you know, little right angle style screwdriver. Draw, draw an imaginary line where like the body work would go. It, it goes like kind of across right here. Got it, okay. Check out this rear shock, look at that thing. That thing's like longer than a GTS shock. I don't know what the total travel is on, but it's like way longer than you know the shocks found in other models. So, what would you guesstimate the length, the the, the additional length is on this shock versus the older leader motor? I don't know. It looks like it's about three inches longer. Okay. I would guess, you know. Um, the belt is essentially the same, you know, same size belt as used on the older uh, LX. ET4 style motor, but they've substantially improved it. The fan's like about twice the size of the old one. And I think they've just found if you keep the belt cooler, it prolongs the belt life. And that's why these can go uh, further between intervals. You know, they've just improved on a lot of design aspects of this engine. And another thing is they're, they're a lot smoother because they use a newer um, uh, engine pivot system. Basically, this, this little part, now it's fixed to the frame. Then there's the, um, the pivot bolt. And you know, somehow, you know, the way it's engineered, it isolates the vibration much better than the older design. You know, the older uh, pivot mount is kind of just a one piece thing. This thing's got a little bit more going on. There's like needle bearings here. There's needle bearings in this tube here. A little captive cap, you know, of course it all once it's in the frame, it's kind of all bolted up. And there's some type of rubber isolator here that's it's more of a, I don't know, it's closer to the design found on the GTS. 
Am I crazy or aren't there some sort of like needle bearings on the GTS swing arm as well? Yeah, the GTS pretty much same same design. Like I said, they have a pair of needle bearings here and a pair of needle bearings on this other pivot. And Ooh, look at that. Yeah, we just had a a GTS come through that had about seventy thousand miles, and this stuff was still pretty good, but the grease was drying up. We actually ended up rebuilding all this. So it's something to think about when you have tons of miles and you've got bearings in here. It's a good idea to go in there and, you know, re-grease all this stuff. But this, this bike's got 20 miles, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's going to be fine for another uh, 60,000, 70,000 miles. You see the machine rod goes right through and goes on the bearings, some sort of little cap there. Oops. Oh, what about like what? What about this guy right here on the valve cover? Oh, duh. Sorry. Yeah, they. Spark plug. The spark plug cap. If anybody knows, with any of the older, older engine designs, a spark plug cap. Some, if you're gonna go on a long trip, you definitely want to have a spark plug cap with you, because the coil on all other models that you actually mount the coil, you know, which is this little guy right here, it's mounted on the frame. So with this mounted to the frame and the wire, you know in the engine vibrating, you know, it tends to wear out the spark plug cap. On this one, the coil is now with the engine and you can see they have everything kind of, you know, the wire's not moving as the motor's going up and down. And this spark plug cap is Ooh, a new, nice. new style, style, all rubber, kind of, I don't know. We have a couple three valve motors with some good miles on them. Haven't seen any issues with them, so they're. And is it harder to change the spark to plug on these ones? Well, that's always a complaint with people with the leader 150 motors. What would you say, Robot? Uh, it's actually a little easier because the, the door is, is um, much easier to, you know, to get to and it's more of a center, center plug, so it's right through that door right there. Yeah, and the access door is significantly larger on this bike, if I'm mistaken. Yeah, it's much, much larger. There's, you know, pretty much a 5 8 drive spark plug socket to pull out. You know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to actually check the valves. All right, cool. Well, he's... Uh, you know, with the motor out, it's a super quick job. Let's check out the spark plug. So there's a spark plug. You know, CR8EB. And there's also EKB, which is the dual electrode that's found on the 300. You could actually put the dual electrode plug on this, and it will last a little bit longer. Or just stick with the, the original plug, the CR8. <clears throat> you could also use the Iridium one, I assume, right? And those those typically last just as long as the EKB, the Iridium le electrode, is less likely to wear out. So. How about this sensor up here, this blue one? Uh, that's a cylinder head temperature sensor, and it uses that sensor, the, the fuel injection system, uses that sensor to, to uh, adjust how much fuel the, the engine needs when it's cool because a cold motor needs additional fuel because the, uh, the fuel puddles on the cold cylinder cylinder wall, so you need more fuel to run them when they're cool until they warm up to operating temperature. And it also probably has something to do with some of the idle control because a cold engine has more resistance, you know, hence um, the idle control valve needs to allow more air to bypass the control that, it, you know, the idle, so. So pretty much do a valve adjustment on this motor. Of course, it's gonna be super duper simple with the motor out and nice I could show everybody, but you could do this whole job all through the access door. Uh, the techs that do this more frequently, me, Nick, and uh, Luis, they, they like to actually take the bike off the center stand and have the front clamp, and that allows the motor to pivot down a little bit. Uh, the few uh, scooters I've done valve adjustments on, or the three valve ones, I tend to loosen this rear shock. And for a home user, it may, may be a good idea to loosen the rear shock and put some sort of um, you know, stand underneath. And the whole idea is if you have the shock loose, you can adjust the stand to kind of adjust the, the position of this valve cover to gain access to all three or all four of these. So where would you put that stand? Would you put that stand underneath the chassis or underneath the swing arm portion of the motor? Uh, right under the middle, the uh, you know, kind of the chassis, the, right in the center. So what he's saying is we'll use this frame. This is, by the way, the new frame. You can see Robot obviously kind of ripped apart the old frame and has already started pulling in all the wiring and stuff like that. We'll have him come talk about that later. But he was talking about where that jack stand goes. The Vespa frames, all of them have this nice, relatively flat spot underneath here. And that's what he's saying. You can kind of lift that up 
up and down so you can kind of gain access to the uh, valve cover and the uh, valve cover adjusting tappets. Oxygen sensor, obviously, that little guy right there on the exhaust goes up to this nice, what, three pin, four pin style connector. Yeah, they four have, pin connector. Yeah, the new oxygen sensor is a different design, so much smaller. And that's kind of standard across the motorcycles now. They all use these little teeny guys there. So, Oil filter in the basically the same spot as the uh, other 150 motors. The same style of uh, flange like drain nut underneath there. You can see that. Oh, that's a good shot. So I got the light, the camera, and the wrist monitor thing going. Uh, engine oil dipstick obviously goes there. What's the oil capacity like on this motor? Uh, it's around uh, 1.2, 1.3 liters. So is that a tiny bit more than the older liter motor? Or? Yeah, a little bit, just slightly more. Yeah, not. There is no gear oil that, dipstick on this one. That's of course with the filter, you know, the filter. They hold more gear oil than the old ones. And there's no dipstick on these, right? No, it's it, you fill until it dribbles out of that drain bolt or you can pump it up with a specified amount, which is, I think, I don't know, don't hold me to it, but it's like, I think it's 220 or 230 cc's. If I had Nick here, he's done like, he's probably done a hundred of uh, gear oil changes on one of these for every one I've done. <laughs> and the drain plug is oh, down directly underneath here. So. Yeah, it's right on the other side. You'll see it, you'll be able to access it from, yeah, a little different than the old designs. Right there. So it's kind of at six o'clock from the center of the Vespa thing. <clears throat> so there you go, there's a valve adjustment. Get the spark plug back in. Talk about the fork next. All right, we get to, uh, see I got two forks out. The original fork is uh, pretty bent. Bent in a different way than I normally see Bashwood forks. This is like a new design fork. Um, you can kind of see that this is no longer straight right here. It actually bent the uh, upper tube. Most of the time when I've seen uh, severely wrecked uh, Vespas, usually this uh, older tube, the older style, they didn't have this cast steel knuckle in here. It was actually just a bent, like a, you know, a J-shaped bent tube. And, you know, that kind of is a testament how much stronger this new design is is it actually bend something else other than the actual fork because I'm sure this lower cast member is perfectly, you know, still straight. But unfortunately, you bend a fork, you can't really rebuild this, this part of it. You could remove the, um, the knuckle and the shock and all the other goodies and move it over to a new fork. Hey, one of the major improvements with the 2015 Sprints and Primaveras is this whole new engineered, like, front fork design and the flip that over robot, right? It's not so much the fork, but the way the uh, <clears throat> the shot connects to the thing. It doesn't have the conventional like kind of trailing link style. The old style, they usually had lots of grease in here because actually the speedo drive was all inside this, um, this assembly. Now it's just a pair of needle bearings like they've always had on Vespas. You know, since P200 essentially, but that's what I'm talking about. You know, much larger than the older ones. Um, this, you know, I don't know the mechanics behind it. I haven't really th thought about it too much yet, I guess, but it works really well. I can tell you that is this new, new style pivot actually for some reason pivots that way versus the old one where it was solidly mounted and somehow the whole geometry of this knuckle and that, you know, makes them makes this front end work so much better than the older design. Much less divey. I mean, Robot and I have each put a lot of miles on the Sprint Supreme of Ares and the ride feeling is vastly improved over the older 150s, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, I, it definitely, they don't dive as much. They just kind of have a firmer feel when you're, you know, riding them around. Uh, since they don't have the, the speedometer drive, this is actually where the uh, ABS speed sensor goes, right there. And, you know, between the Primavera and Sprint, they're actually different speed sensors because the ABS needs to detect the wheel speed uh, with greater accuracy. And I'll show you what the um, actual hub has. So this is a hub, much like any of the other disc brake Vespas. There's no speedometer drive gear here, but they have this uh, 
tone wheel or ring wheel right here. It's bolted in there. And the actual little Hall effect sensor, which is like a, a type of a magnetic sensor, detects those little holes. And that's how it can um, detect the, you know, if the, um, the wheel, wheel speed slows down much more, or much faster than anticipated, then it would activate the ABS system to varying degrees. So we're good in layman term, no mechanical speedometer cable, no mechanical speedometer drive. It's a, kind of an electromagnetic thing. The, in theory, it should require very little maintenance, correct, Robert? Yep. Same uh, caliper that's used on the GTS. I can attest to these uh, brake pads. They'll last like uh, 40, 50,000 miles of just kind of regular American riding. Maybe if you're riding around in Guadalajara where it's like stop and go all the time like crazy, <laughs> they're not going to last as long. Or Mexico City. Yeah, or Mexico City. Just kind of got a taste of that last week, but you know. These pads uh, last substantially longer than the older, the older pads found on LXs. You talked about that, but just reiterate what that is. Yeah, that's the sensor. It kind of floats above those holes, and there's, you know, it's a, you know, a completely solid state. You know, they call it a Hall effect sensor, which is a type of magnetic sensing, and that's how it can detect those. Um, those holes right there. And the LX and S series, they used obviously just they used the single pin caliper, correct? You no, know, the, the, they were a, a double acting caliper. So they have a piston on each side. This is a, um, you know, a sliding pin style caliper. It's a caliper, it's got a pair of pistons on one side, but it actually slides, you know, the whole caliper actually slides. You know, some, you know, mo most sport bikes have a pair of, or even three pistons on each side actually. But this, this design is pretty robust and works uh, perfectly adequate for the Vespa. And st stopping power is great, you know, considering this is essentially a GTS braking system on the, the smaller bright, you know, the smaller 150 scooter. You know, it's got a slightly smaller rotor, similar size. And I mean, I guess, I mean, I can attest to this just overall size difference in the brake pads on like a LX series bike. I mean, the brake pads, as far as just like the, sh the volume or the surface area or about half the size of that, right, mm -hmm. robot? Yeah, about, you know, it, probably even less, less. than that. Okay. You know, these are much, much thicker, about twice the thickness of those original ones and just larger, so. And you can see no speedometer cable. It's actually electrical cable. They put additional insulation that goes around there. It's got this connection, sealed connector that goes into the ABS system. And it also obviously goes to the speedometer electronically. Um, the, the brake hose doesn't, isn't long enough to make it to the handlebars. It actually goes into the ABS pump. And I'll show you that. I so just that put, connects to the ABS pump. And a lot of times with ABS systems, you want to be extra careful not to get air into them. So this whole system is still filled with uh, fluid. And I put a rubber cap over it. For anybody who's going to tackle tearing one of these down, you know, something to keep in mind. And same with even the, um, the lever. This still has fluid in it, but it's not leaking any fluid. But if you have the lever uh, pulled all the way to the, um, the grip, it actually closes off the, um, the bypass port. If the lever's open, then it's gonna just dribble coolant or dribble brake fluid out. So, it's, so that's why you got a zip tie. Yeah, port. it's kind of a, a tip, and then there's even a service bolt-in for the GTSs that you need to do this procedure. And just show you when it wrecked, it kind of like just took off both mirrors. So this whole perch is going to need to be removed, replaced. Oh um, wow! You can see that actually snapped it off. Just snapped the piece right There's off. There's the black, and then the silver you see is like the bare cast aluminum that's been broken off. Crazy. Okay. And that one, I'll I'll be able to extract that. Not that big a deal. And then maybe pull the new fork up there and just kind of show, like side by side. God, those things are so robust now. I don't know. You can see it. <laughs> Look how bent that thing is. So that kind of does that. This one goes nice and straight. Yeah, you can see that. This bike had a serious, serious impact. Talk about the frame next? Yeah, I'll show you the frame. Um, the frame's been completely re-engineered re on this scooter. It's supposedly, I don't remember what the number is, it says somewhere in some Vespa literature, but it's like 50 or, I don't know, 75% mm. 
more rigid than the older design, which means it flexes less when you're um, riding the scooter around. Are you taking pictures over there? Mm hmm Are you? Yep. Oh, cool. Got a time lapse going <laughs> uh, of the build, build of this frame. So as you can see, this was a bare frame with nothing on it. The fuel tank's all installed, the wiring harness is installed. This air, air, air box plenum, which is like a two-piece plenum, is installed. So, you know, this is much like the old ET4, which was a great design. The air filters last so long with the, uh, drawing the air from up here versus the LX and the GTS where they pull the air from where the tire is. So this actually goes into the air filter. And this is like a, a plenum, you know, it's a specially designed piece of plastic that kind of, it's kind of like a muffler for the intake, essentially. That is true, the Vespas have very little intake noise, huh? So fuel tanks installed, you can see the, um, the fuel pumps right there, back behind here. Where's and the fuel pump again? It's all underneath this, this guy right here. Further back is a, um, the fuel level sensor, but you know, can I see. Just, oh, you can see a little bit of it. You need a pointer. Not, not a finger. Oh, you want this crazy thing? It's I clean my teeth with it. Your finger. Ooh, little pops there. So, you know, I got the wiring harness. This actually goes to the motor. So all the electrical connections for the fuel injection, um, the charging system, all the Which, starter, all made. Show me each. Let's point out each connector while you're at it, if you don't mind. Okay. So this one is your three-phase alternator or you know stator connection so there's essentially there's three of the terminals are for charging there's two terminals that are for the the crankshaft position sensor and the the computer and the scooter detects the um the crank position by uh much like that abs sensor there's like little pips on the outside of the flywheel there's actually 24 of them so it could detect the position of the motor you know yeah, and that's how it could fire the um, the spark at the right time. Same with the fuel injection, no RPMs and all that stuff. And then there's also a pin for uh, oil pressure. They have an oil pressure switch on these scooters. Um, got more connectors. This little four pin guy is at the, um, the heated O2 sensor. You got your coolant temp, this is, and this is your injector. They're actually the same connector. They color code them because if you reverse them, something's not gonna work right. But they're essentially the same so wash what, style. What's what again? Fuel injector, cylinder head temperature. Okay. On the sensor, color-coded on the... And they're color-coded on the other side, the actual too. actual sensors are color-coded, yeah. I remember that, okay. Mm -hmm. Starter motor, you got a ground and a, a, the actual starter. And on this side, you got a throttle position sensor, which is like a rheostat or a potentiometer that, you know, uh, uh, essentially signals how, how much the throttle is open. This is the two pins that go to your idle air control. Basically, the ECU gives little pulses, electrical pulses. The more or the longer pulses, you know, allow more air to go into the motor. The shorter pulses are less air and it's all electronically controlled, so there's nothing, you know, no idle speed that you actually adjust on these. And these two terminals are your connections for the, um, that little ignition coil that's on the, um, the motor. Two throttle cables, right? A pair of throttle cables, you got, everything modern has a push and a pull cable, or even more modern than this, sometimes they're drive-by wire, but they have a pull cable, or a push cable. If there's ever a chance where the throttle gets stuck, you'll be able to roll the throttle back and close the throttle so you don't end up with a stuck stuck throttle. You know, none of these manufacturers want to have a situation like Toyota did. <laughs> Whatever that was, four years ago, five so years ago. So then the throttle cables run up through that hole and just continue to run up that way on the left side through the bundle and they'll terminate and connect from the handlebars up there. What about this? This little guy is a, um, on the GTS this is also found and it's an uh, electromechanical motor that pops the seat and there's a little spring and it's actually a control cable goes to the back it's not actually hooked up to the latch yet but that's that's what opens up the uh, seat and the seat button's right in here right yeah and there's a little connection that goes to that cool and you can even see there's a purple with a black stripe purple with a black stripe right there 
from a lock shine. And some other goodness found behind a leg shield that you don't normally see. You got the immobilizer detection ring. You know, it's essentially a, a, a coil of wires. Can you it, maybe if you the Yeah, I'll do the flashlight right here. So the the actual ECU that controls the fuel injection and the immobilizer spark is all all in that little guy right there. It sends a little electrical pulse to this to energize the chip in here. And then the chip sends a signal back to this and you know with a certain a specific code sequence. And if it sees that the correct code then it enables the starting. So the sprint ECU is has ECU functionality and ABS functionality. Yeah it's all in that one box. There's some some models of the scooters that have multiple boxes. Do you think that's the same as the GTS's? No, it's a different whole new car. new brand. It's actually So the GTS ABS has a different module and everything. Yeah, it's a completely different different setup. And what's that down there? The this is actually the little the ABS pump for the uh, the front brakes. It's just there's a little motor pump in here and there's probably two valves that kind of regulate the uh, brake pressure and that's how it can you know regulate you know, prevent a locked up front wheel if you're really on the uh, brakes. You know, it's just this little aluminum box right here. And the connection to that, um, the speed sensor is on the wheel. Then you got some uh, other new sensors down here. This is actually a, a roll sensor down here. Down here? That little guy. So if the scooter falls off, falls over, it shuts the motor down. And that's just a safety feature that's found on all the newer scooters. How about that relay there? The starter relay. Cool. It's kind of hard to get to, but you know, that's out of the weather and, and that's just where they put it. And some <laughs> of these other connectors here. Uh, you got your fuse block. That pokes through the glove yeah, box, Yeah, you got right? four fuses here. And then in your, um, in your battery tray, there's two additional fuses right there. I can't really tell you what they are. You know, I can tell you, well, this, this fuse right here, this five amp, that's your tail and brake light, or no, the tail light and the running lights, the speedometer lights. Um, this gray and, gray and red is your headlight circuit, I think. I'm pretty sure it's the circuit, the headlight circuit, 10 amp. And um, I think the other two are like, uh, that red with white is like your brake light. This white one, I think, might be your ignition of some sort. Down here, the 20 amp is your master fuse, and I, if I recall, the 10 amp might be the ABS pump fuse, the, the, the fuse that powers this ABS system. So I guess the Primavera wouldn't have that. Yeah, I think there's one less. There's one less fuse on a Primavera. Voltage regulator. Um, voltage regulator looks pretty familiar. No. Same one as yeah, the. The, um, the old ET4s, LX, same, same exact part there. Rinky dink little horn, all right? Yeah, just just enough room if you want to put the 136 horn, you can do that. There's the two cables that go to the, the seat pop. One's the electro electromechanical actuated one. The other one's a manual release that's found in your glove box. Oh yeah, did we show the manual release one? Uh, well, it's a little lever that's in your glove box, but and I guess the cable the actual somewhere. cable is um, buried somewhere. Oops. Oh, there kinda, it is. You know, and it, it's, it goes to the little lever. It actually protrudes right through the glove box. So. Pretty good. What else can we say about this thing? I don't know. Pretty awesome bikes. I want one. But <laughs> I already have too many scooters right now, so. I couldn't help it. We had to get one. That's the bike that uh, my wife Christina drove all the way to Mexico City just last week. And I tell you, we made some modifications to it before we left. What we do, Robot, we took the gears out of a Primavera, the final drive, and put it in the Sprint to kind of give it an overdrive. We did the lighter rollers. We put also the Kropovich exhaust. And I tell you, that bike had as good a range as a GTS 250 and 300. Didn't go every bit as fast, especially up the hills. But uh, when we were doing sustained stretches, it started to 70, 70. 375 miles an hour. Uh, my wife was definitely keeping up. These bikes are awesome. And the last one is, um, anybody wondering, can you put an alarm system on it or can you use any of our accessories like the, um, the um, 
the cigarette lighter outlet, you know, or the whatever you want to call it, cell phone charger, USB jack. That connector is actually located underneath the floorboard right on top of the, um, you know, that right next to the, the seat pop. And from actuator. the factory, it's just encapsulated and wrapped up in electrical tape? Yeah, just to protect it. It's a, the same, same connector they've been using for years. It's not that newer style that's used on the ABS. Uh, GTS, so you can use um, you can purchase a, a PP1, which is the connector that plugs into this, and then you know get the USB jack and dr drill drill some holes in inside your glove box to put a, a USB jack in there. How about this this hydraulic line? I know we talked about it on the fork, but this that's the one that I guess goes up to the handlebars, right? Yeah, it goes right up to the the master cylinder right there. Again, I have a little little rubber plug in there, and it keeps. The fluid that's in here from drip dripping out. You definitely don't want to be dripping brake fluid all over a brand new paint finish. And so then the brake line that's on the fork ties into the that pump, and I pump. actually have that whole plug too. You can kind of see on this side. Let me come over there. Well, I guess it'll be pretty obvious. Someone. Yeah, right, right it. there. Got it. Okay. And on the GTS with ABS, it's got front and rear ABS, so. It's got pretty much twice as much going on with the uh, brake lines and the, the ABS pumps a little bit larger. Those. All right, good take, robot. Yeah, no one long one. Good job. Thanks for all the info. Cool, cool.